Well, this is the More Than Sunday at the River uh, podcast, audio cast, video cast. I don't know what the proper term is, but anyways, uh, we'll be doing this on a weekly basis during the, during the midweek. And uh, the whole idea is that uh, there's so much more to be able to explore and discuss and talk about than can possibly be done on a Sunday. And uh, there's oftentimes lots of uh, questions that everyone has and and uh, so many topics. And I just want to be able to have the freedom and the opportunity and the platform to be able to to do that. I hope you'll uh, help me out uh, to make this interesting for you and valuable for you. And of course, you can do that by uh, giving me questions or sending me questions, uh, making suggestions on topics to cover that would be of interest to you. And uh, nothing is off limits whatsoever. Any topic, any place, uh, that you want to go or that I feel like going, we're just going to cover it in these times. So uh, anyways, this is kind of the, the uh, kickoff. And of course, we're in the middle of a pandemic and it's hard to talk about anything else going on right now. And so why not just kick it off there? Uh, there are so many things to talk about in terms of this pandemic and what's going on. And I'd love to, again, hear your feedback on things maybe you'd like to have more information on. I have gotten some questions that may be a little bit more of a theological nature. So that's kind of the things I wanted to focus on first. Things like, is coronavirus a sign of God's judgment? Uh, you know, is this a sign of the last days? Or I even uh, had a question about, you know, the mark of the beast. There's been, I guess, some, some talk about, uh, you know, could this be an opportunity to be able to uh, kind of open the door for that uh, mark to be given, whether it's some kind of tracing app or some kind of chip or your phone, or I've even heard uh, talk about maybe, you know, mandatory vaccines somehow, you know, slipping in this thing. So, so I thought maybe we kind of talk about some of those things first, and then maybe in the next episode, we can talk about a lot of other things associated with uh, this pandemic that we're going through. So let's just start with the question, is coronavirus or COVID-19 or uh, the other one, uh, SARS-CoV-2, whatever term you want to use for it, uh, is this some kind of, is this like a, uh, is this like a part of God's judgment? And of course, uh, it is an interesting, it's a pretty important question. Um, just the whole topic of, of judgment in general is, is huge, and I don't want to go into all of it today. I just kind of want to address the specific question. Maybe on another episode we could talk about it. And, you know, just, just real quick, you know, that, the, the, the whole uh, concept of judgment in the Bible is actually quite a big topic and uh, much bigger and much more uh, nuanced than I think a lot of people realize. Um, most people have kind of a negative view of judgment, but the biblical picture is actually a little bit more positive because a lot of the things associated with judgment are actually good things like God standing up for justice. That's an example of, God, of God's judgment. But a lot of times when people use this, this idea of, of judgment, we think of it more in the negative sense, meaning you know, more the idea that God is bringing punishment for sin so that at some point the sinfulness of humanity or the sinfulness of of a group of people, the sinfulness of an individual or something, it reaches a point where God needs to bring some kind of punishment against that, and that is God's judgment. So usually that's kind of the context that most people think, and probably the context in which this question is, you know, is, is this virus sort of a, you know, could this be God's judgment? And, uh, you know, scenario I think we have to be, you know, very careful of, uh, you know, on the one hand, um, we certainly see examples in the scriptures of God bringing these kind of judgments upon the earth. And certainly the most dramatic example of that would be the flood. Uh, there are other examples that we see, uh, particularly with the nation of Israel, where there are some times where God brings these judgments uh, upon the nation. And, um, and I think, you know, we see in the scripture when God does that, he makes it very clear and very specific that this is him doing that. And there's a reason and a purpose behind it. And, uh, and so uh, unless we have that kind of specific 
you know, word from the Lord where he is taking responsibility um, in some way for something that is happening, whether it's a, you know, whether he's bringing it himself or even just in a sense deliberately or intentionally allowing something. That's oftentimes what happens sometimes uh, when things happened in, in the Old Testament. It was really, really more of a sense of God deliberately and intentionally just allowing things to play out the way that they're going as his judgment. He just kind of basically lets you experience the bitter consequences of the choices and direction that you're heading. And, um, but, but unless God is specifically saying that, you know, I don't think we have any right and we should certainly avoid uh, putting his name onto things that he hasn't said. You know, and even when you look at those times in the scripture where God has, it's important to remember they really are rare. Just because you see several instances of it happening, you know, you have to remember this is, you know, the, the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, is covering, you know, well over a thousand years of history. And uh, there were lots and lots and lots of things that happened, bad things that happened. We live in a world full of bad things and, and trouble. And, you know, rarely are they attributed to God's judgment. But there are times where they were. And again, when they were, it was because the Lord himself specifically spoke and said, this is something I'm bringing or allowing for a specific purpose. So without God doing that, I don't think we have the right to do that. And I'm not aware of, of God uh, saying that about coronavirus. So I don't think we should either. I think we do want to really remember that the primary emphasis, the primary thrust of the scriptures is that, you know, God is he's healing, he's restoring, uh, he's protecting, he's doing good. And, and, and the scripture is clear that, that God's goodness is not actually dependent on the condition of humanity. That when we're good, when we're doing well, when we're not doing well, he's still is gracious and uh, and doing good things. You know, he lets his rain. He 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 rains. He brings rain upon both the righteous and the wicked, as one scripture says. So I think it's important to uh, remember that. I mean, let's, let's remember the the words of Jesus when he said, "I did not come to condemn the world, but rather to save the world." Okay, and uh, <clears throat> you know. There's a, uh, there's a wonderful story uh, told about uh, the famous composer Beethoven. And, um, you know, sometimes he would play for, like, you know, some well-to-do patrons, you know, in a kind of a private setting. And, and uh, you know, he could tell sometimes that maybe his audience just wasn't that much into serious music and really just, you know, wanted to hear something nice and beautiful and soothing and, kind of you know, just kind of kind of, you know, confirming that their little world was all well and good. And, uh, and so sometimes he would kind of play this trick if he kind of sensed that was going on and he would, he would play something very gentle and, and very beautiful and kind of lull his audience into, into that. And, and as it would appear that, uh, you know, that it was coming to an end and kind of the, the music notes were quietly fading and everyone was kind of lulled into this beautiful gentle music he would suddenly crash his forearm down upon the keys and just shock and startle and jolt everybody and of course he would get a good laugh out of out of their reaction but you know his basic his basic you know motivation for wanting to do this whether you think it was appropriate or not was just a, it was just kind of send the message that listen despite the fact that there is a lot of beauty in the world there's also a lot of pain and suffering and, and things that aren't so beautiful. And that was kind of his way. And, you know, to me, I mean, we, we, we kind of see this with, with Jesus himself as well. I mean, his message, of course, was a message of grace. It was a message of good news. It was a, it was a message of love and kindness and forgiveness and mercy and, and uh, just how, how over the top ridiculous, almost scandalous that the grace of God is towards people. And he was and he and he brought this, this was the thrust of his message. But he would also oftentimes in the midst of this, and when he's healing people and doing this, he would also sometimes just bring these shocking, jolting words of warning 
<clears throat> and there were words of warning that, listen, you cannot reject his message of love and, and peace. You can't reject his message of forgiveness and reconciliation with God. You can't, you can't reject this good news and just think it'll all turn out for you good in the end. You can't do that. And so he would, he would, he would try to jolt people out of their uh, complacency or out of their blindness or out of their unbelief or their, or their refusal to just open their eyes and see what was happening before them. And, and uh, you know, their, their laziness not to really comprehend the message he was bringing and just thinking that it could just be okay even if you rejected that. And so he would, he would jolt that in. You know, <clears throat> events like this pandemic that we're in, um, you know, to me, again, I'm, unless God is taking responsibility for it very specifically and clearly, we have no right to do it, nor should we. As a matter of fact, I would argue it's probably a form of blasphemy to credit God with something that, like this when he has not <clears throat> taken any responsibility for it. But events like this, they do have a message. They're like the forearm coming down on the keys that just kind of jolt us sometimes. And, and uh, you know, rather than say, is this God's judgment? It'd be, it, I think it's more appropriate to say, you know, what does uh, like this pandemic tell us? Uh, C.S. Lewis wrote a, wrote a fascinating book called The Problem of, of Pain. And uh, just kind of addressing the issue of of uh, pain and suffering in the world. But he, I, and, I, and I just want to quote him. So he, he wrote this. He said, We can ignore a lot of things, even pleasure, but pain insists on being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And I just thought that was just interesting that, uh, that uh, C.S. Lewis, you know, had this perspective that uh, sometimes there's just, it's the, there's the pain and the suffering in the world becomes a megaphone, if you will, for God to be able to, to get our attention and say, listen, everything is not okay. Uh, there is something seriously, deeply, and fundamentally wrong and flawed with this world, and it's, it's not because God's not a good creator. There's something else at work here. But God is the one who is going to deal with that. And we need, and the root of that, of the root, the ultimate root problem that prevents um, God from continuing this project and bringing it to where he wants to is, is unbelief and the refusal to be persuaded that God is good and trustworthy, that he is real and that we can put our complete confidence in him and must put our complete confidence in, in him and that we were created to be his image bearers. We were you know, and, then, and, a, and that whenever we put our loyalty and our allegiance and our worship towards something else besides him, it inevitably causes things to go deeply wrong in the long term. And, uh, and so, you know, I think, you know, something like, like this coronavirus, you know, this, this, this pandemic, it does, it does speak some things to us. And... Um, you know, it, it, it says that, that, that there is something wrong, and it, 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 it forces us, I think, to, to face the fact that we are deeply vulnerable and that we are, apart from God who is the source of life, apart from Him, we are mortal. And so we're faced with our mortality. We're faced with our vulnerability. We're faced with, this, with the fact that we, we can't fully put our trust, we can't fully trust nature uh, nature uh, causes all kinds of uh, bad things to happen. You know, earthquakes, tsunamis, viruses. You can't trust nature. You can't trust uh, uh, our government leaders. And I don't mean can't trust them at all, but you can't. That's not where our trust lies. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, we may well discover, and many are already pointing it out, that, that some of the responses of our leaders, you know, maybe may causing uh, more problems than the virus. <clears throat> and even if you think that the response that our government leaders has have have taken is is appropriate, <clears throat> you, you it would be completely naive not to recognize the incredible destruction 
and harm that is being done by those policies. Even if you think they were the only choice we had, you can't ignore the fact that they are causing so much pain <clears throat> and all kinds of other unintended consequences. You can't put your, your, our trust in our medical system. That doesn't mean it's not a good medical system. It doesn't mean we're not thankful for doctors and modern medicine. Praise God for these things. But listen, this, you know, part of the reason why, um, you know, such drastic actions were taken was to try to save the medical system from being overwhelmed. <clears throat> because it's even the medical system for all of the money and all of the people and all of the resources and all of our technology and all of the all the tremendous advancements we've made and how awesome our medical system is <coughs> it could be overwhelmed so quickly by just this virus and so that we, we we just can't put our trust in those things our ultimate trust and so that's some of the things that that this tells us you know it's interesting uh, there's a um, kind of a fascinating uh, story recorded in Luke chapter 13. And um, in some ways, it's sort of a, um, it's almost like they come to Jesus and they're asking him sort of, you know, what, what today, it's a little bit different, but, but today we oftentimes hear this question, you know, why do good things, why do bad things happen to good people? And Jesus kind of got asked that question, sort of, and it was in the context of he was, you know, giving some warnings, and and uh, and so um, they brought to his attention this event that had happened, uh, where Pontius Pilate had uh, massacred uh, Galilean Jews who had come from Galilee to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. We don't know what the cause of it was, or what his motivation was, but what we do know about the man, this is the story is consistent with the kind of man he was. But for, for whatever reason, these Galilean Jews came to the temple, and for some reason, Pilate, he had them killed right there at the temple. And of course, it was like, well, how, how does that happen? How does God allow some Jewish people who have come to his house to have come to his temple, even? These are obviously people who come to worship God. So and yet they get killed. And so the, 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 the implication behind this question is, you know, had they done something, were these sinners? Had they done something, was this a form of God's judgment upon them? And, uh, and Jesus makes it clear, no, this was not the judgment of God. Even though he had been making warnings, he said, that's not it. It's not, you know, um, he, he says they weren't any worse sinners than all the rest of the Jews in Galilee, and then he and then he goes on, and and then he speaks about a, a tower that had fallen in Jerusalem and killed eighteen people. He said, "Were they any worse? Was that some kind?" Of, he says, "That wasn't judgment. That was that that didn't happen because they were worse than everybody else who was in the city at the time." Um, and so he's you know making the statement about both you know moral evil and natural evil. He said, "That's that's not God's judgment in this case." He says. But then he goes on and says, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. And uh, wow, that seems like an odd comment. And again, his point just being, listen, you can't, we live in a world full of evil. Some of that evil is what we might call moral evil, meaning that people do morally evil things to other people. Um, and some of the evil in the world is we might call it natural. It's natural disasters, you know, accidents, things like that. We live in a world like that. And um, unless we, we turn back to the creator of the world, unless we put our allegiance and our worship where it rightly belongs, then, then you know, the evil in this world will, will likely get us too. It will, it will take us. And it's like, you know, even with, even with coronavirus, listen, if, if coronavirus doesn't, doesn't get you, you know, cancer might get you, a heart attack might get you, a car accident might get you. There's all kinds of number of things. And listen, if none of that gets you, if no disease ever touches you, if you never have an accident that, that takes your life, old age is going to get you. I mean, you're not going to avoid death. And, uh, and, you know, the point being that, listen, we, you know, we can't refuse 
the message of, of God's goodness, the message of God's love, the message of God's forgiveness and mercy and kindness and peace, peace with Him and peace with one another. We can't refuse that message and then just think evil's not going to get us. It's not going to happen. And uh, you're not going to escape. You're not going to escape it. We really honestly do need a Savior. And the good news is we have a Savior. And yes, we are vulnerable. And yes, we are mortal in and of ourselves. But the good news is we have a Creator who loves us, who forgives us, who died for us, who has proven his uh, power over the ultimate enemy of death, but through his own resurrection. And uh, he promises that those who put their trust and their, and their faith in him, he will prove himself faithful. And he, in the end, will raise you from the dead. He will deliver you from all evil. And the day is coming, my friend, when God really is going to bring this to its, this creation project, to its intended creation uh, and a purpose, which is you, the uniting of heaven and earth to, to be a, a dwelling place for God and a dwelling place for us with him, uh, where he will wipe away every tear. And so that really is the good news. And, and rather than thinking about the coronavirus as somehow God's judgment, I think we just need to think of it more in terms of it, it, it does tell us something. It tells us something about our need, again, once again, that this world uh, needs, desperately needs uh, a Savior. And, uh, and, the, and the first step towards this world being turned around for its intended purpose is for humanity to be turned around back to the proper respect and awe and worship and relationship with God. All right, so that's on that one. Also got a question about uh, coronavirus and the last days. So is coronavirus, maybe it's not judgment, but is it a sign of the last days? Could we be in the last days? And um, the short answer, um, I think, is yes, uh, but not in the way that most people think of it. And I, I think a lot of the um, confusion comes from the fact that, that, that too many people have thought of the last days merely as a short period of time immediately preceding uh, the reappearance of Jesus. But the more uh, accurate, I believe, um, understanding of the last days is the last days covers the entire period from the first appearance of Jesus to his reappearance one day. The entire period is the last days. So we're in the last days and we've been in the last days for 2,000 years. And there's, uh, let me just give you a couple of quick scriptures just so you don't think I'm uh, lying to you. You know, Hebrews 1-2 uh, says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. So God's been speaking. He's not going to speak through his son, you know, in a couple of years before his return. He's been speaking to us since Jesus appeared. And all through this, these last 2,000 years, God has been speaking through his son, Jesus. So we're in those last days is my point. Uh, 1 Timothy 3 says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. In the last days, difficult times will come. Well, has there not been difficult times for most of human history? I mean, <laughs> and he uh, says, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, unreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, love pleasure rather than lovers of God. They'll hold to a form of godliness, even though they've denied its power. In other words, they'll just be super religious, but never actually experience the true power of God by the Holy Spirit. Listen, that pretty much describes every generation, which is why every generation thinks it's in the last days, because every generation is in the last days, because we're in these last days. There is nothing special about that. Paul's just describing that, listen, 
This, that is what characterizes the time period that we're in before the reappearance of Jesus, is that we're in this time where people are behaving badly and things are going oftentimes wrong. We have trouble and we have difficulty and people are part of the problem. Nothing new. It's part of the last days, which has been going on for a little bit of a while now. First Peter 1.20 says, For he has foreknown before the foundation of the world, but he has appeared in these last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God. So Jesus appeared in the last days. He appeared 2,000 years ago. He's now ascended at the right hand of the Father. He'll appear once again. It's all part of the last days. You know, um, the Old Testament says that, that one of the signs, if you will, um, or one of the things that would happen in the last days is that God would pour out His Spirit on all humanity. And there's lots of references. Numbers, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and of course one of the most famous, of course, is Joel chapter 2, where God says He will pour out His Spirit upon, you know, all flesh. And you may remember that on the, on the day of Pentecost, recorded in Acts chapter 2, when the disciples are filled with the Holy Spirit and Peter gets up and he starts to preach because everyone's kind of wondering what's happening here. And Peter quotes Joel chapter 2. And he says, And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Well, when did God pour out his spirit on all flesh? Well, he started doing it with the disciples on Pentecost 2,000 years ago. And all of those who put their faith and who put their uh, trust in Jesus, Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. He baptizes, he gives Holy Spirit to all of those who profess faith in him. He's been doing it for 2,000 years. So again, we're in these last days. Um, Matthew chapter 24 and 25 are very well-known chapters and uh, where Jesus speaks about uh, his, his coming. And to give, to give context to it, you have to read the, the very end of chapter 23, and it says that Jesus is kind of lamenting over Jerusalem, which represents his, his, his chosen people. He says, oh, I've longed to gather you like a hen wants to gather her little chicklets under her wings, but you would have nothing to do with it. And then he says, you know, behold, your house is left desolate. And, uh, and he says, you're not, see, you're not going to see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so, if you're, you know, and, and of course, Jesus had, on several occasions, had um, predicted and, uh, that the temple would be destroyed. And it, it was part of a larger prediction that said, listen, if you, again, if you refuse this offer of peace, I'm bringing you the message of peace. I'm bringing you the message of good news. I'm the one you've been looking for all along to bring in and usher in God's kingdom. If you refuse this message and continue on the path that you're going, it's going to end extraordinarily badly for you. It's going to add, matter of fact, it's going to be one of the worst possible national disasters you have ever experienced in all of your life. It's going to be the very destruction of the city and the destruction of the temple. If you keep poking the bear Rome and insisting on just a, a violent rebellion against them, rather than taking my offer of peace and let me deal with these things, Rome is just going to come in and they're going to have zero mercy on you. And it will end very badly. And that was his prophecy. And so, and he prophesied this would happen. And so he says, You're, the temple will be destroyed. And then he also says, and you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes to me. In other words, Jesus will not reappear again until his own original people, the Jewish people, <clears throat> um, welcome and recognize that he is the one uh, that they've been waiting for and that he is their Messiah and God's chosen one. And, uh, and immediately after this, his disciples ask him. And that's where chapter 24 and 25 are Jesus answering the question of when is, this, when he, when is the temple going to be destroyed and when are you going to appear again, you know, in, a, in this more full manner. And so he goes on to answer that, basically. And when you look at it, he's basically, um, he, he basically goes on to say the, the, the temple is going to be destroyed within a generation. It's going to happen within a generation. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, and, and when you see 
the Roman army is surrounding Jerusalem, that's, that's it. That, that's it. That's the time when it's going to uh, be destroyed. And when you see that happening, it is not the time to run to the city for protection. The very opposite. You need to hightail it out of it. You need to do this fast with great urgency. Get out and, and flee because that will be when it'll, it'll happen. And then he goes on to, to basically say, you know, there's going to be all kinds of things. There's going to be all, you know, we're talk about wars and rumors of wars and false prophets will arise and, and all this kind of stuff will happen. And, he's, and, he, and he specifically says, but that's not the end. In other words, when the temple is destroyed, that's not the end, all right? And there will be all kinds of things happening after that. In other words, the trouble that, you, that we've already seen in the world, it's going to continue. You're going to continue to see wars. You're going to continue to see trouble. You're going to continue to see false prophets. You're going to continue to see all this kind of stuff. That will not be the end. And, uh, but he said, but, but here's what's going to happen during that time. You're going to preach the gospel to all the nations or to all the people group. And then the end will come. And so people talk about signs of the last days and signs of the end. They're, they're really missing it. <clears throat> all of the signs that Jesus refers to in terms of wars and earthquakes and famines and all these things, those are not signs of the end. Those are signs that the end has not come. All right? And Jesus goes on and he, and he talks about the fact that, listen, when he appears, nobody's going to be second-guessing. Nobody's going to be wondering. You know, the first time Jesus appeared, it was a very hidden thing. As a matter of fact, nobody was clued in. Nobody knew. There was a handful of people that God sent angels to to let them kind of clue them in. You know, Mary got a visitation from an angel. The shepherds got a visitation. and it was a, There was a small number of people who got kind of clued in that this little baby was more than just a baby. It was something special. This was the this was the God's chosen chosen one, chosen chosen Messiah. Other than that, the rest of the world was completely clueless. Had no idea it was hidden. And uh, which is why we have to preach the gospel. The preaching of the gospel is 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 getting the word out and letting the world know that yes. God sent his son. He has appeared. He has come. And he's actually here today by his spirit. He's reigning from heaven, but he's present on the earth by the Holy Spirit. All right, we're, we're getting that out. And, uh, <clears throat> but the next time Jesus appears, there's, it's not going to be this hidden thing. It's not going to need to be, you know, a massive sending out of, the, of all these messengers to let everybody know. Keep, let them know he's back. Let everybody know. He, no, it's, it's, the sky itself is going to proclaim that Jesus is, is appearing. There's not going to be debate uh, issues. You're not going to be wondering. You're not going to be clueless. It's going to happen. Don't even worry about it. You don't have to, you don't have to worry that you're somehow going to miss it. It'll happen. And he says, but before that, things are just going to kind of continue as, as they've been going in terms of the difficulty and the trouble. Now, of course, this kind of brings up the question, like, why did Jesus come hidden the first time? And why is he coming so, so obvious the second time? Like, why didn't he come that way the first time? And I, you know, it's, I, I don't know the answer exactly. Um, if I had to... Um, if I had to sort of try to do my best to uh, think through that, like why, I think, it, I think it really has something to do with the fact that um, the work of God, uh, this first phase, if you will, so think of it as kind of a two-phase approach for God's redemption. The first phase really has to do with restoring humanity back to faithful worship of God. Um, and, uh, and so that's really a hidden work. If you really think about it, it's a work that happens on the inside. So the gospel, gospel is a message of transformation, but it's an inside-out kind of transformation. It happens on the inside. It's a, it's a message about the work and the grace of God working on your heart and who you are as a person on the inside, if you will. It's an inside-out. So it's a very, in that sense, it's a very hidden kind of work. Now, it's, it's, it becomes more clear and obvious because when someone's heart is changed and there's a work on the inside, it inevitably shows up in the way in which they live their lives. But it is an inside work. And, it's a, and, it, and again, it's, it's primarily a work of faith, meaning 
it's, it's God's grace, but God's grace is at work to produce faith. In other words, to restore us to right relationship, to, to trust him and to know him and to fellowship with him and to commune with him. And, uh, and by its very nature, uh, faith is, is kind of a hidden thing, you know. Um, there's something, you know, for, 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 for Jesus just to appear and do all these big signs and, and whatever um, doesn't necessarily produce faith. It might, it might produce a certain level of external compliance, but that's not what God's after. He's not after external compliance. He's after a, a heart change, a heart that has been changed by his grace and by his love that, that recognizes that the love of God and the grace of God are amazing and incredible. And not only are they worthy of our worship, they're worthy of our imitation. And so I think that's why. And then, so the, and then when he returns again, now it's, it's when, the, when the phase one, which is bringing humanity back, then phase two is, is setting everything else right, including the things that we really messed up pretty badly. And so that's what I think it's all about. But uh, so, so we're in the last days. We've been in the last days for 2,000 years. And all the stuff that's happening, viruses, pandemics, or wars, or whatever other kinds of trouble we see in people behaving badly and doing morally evil things, uh, those are just all signs that we're still in the last days and Jesus hasn't returned. And, uh, and so the only, the only real sign where Jesus says, this is going to happen and then the end will come. The only sign he gave about the, the, the end is near is that the gospel has been preached to every single people group. That is our task. And that is why Peter said, listen, we can hasten the day of the Lord by really engaging in the mission that God has, has given us. And Jesus goes on in chapter 25 to just talk about the implications of what he just said, which is, listen, don't worry about the timing. The point isn't the timing, the point is, are you being faithful in between? In that time between the first and second appearance, are we being faithful to the mission that we have been given? And the degree to which we're not faithful, in a sense, we're just pushing off his appearance, and the degree to which we are, we are bringing it, in a sense, forward. Because he said, even Jesus doesn't know the time. The Father knows, but Jesus doesn't even know and I think there really is a sense in which, you know, that end, you know, obviously it's in the Father's hands and He's sovereign, but there's also a sense in which He is working through us and in us and with us, and so we are cooperating. And we do play a part in that sense of when Jesus is going to reappear because we know it's not going to be before, be before the gospel has been preached to every single people group. All right. And then uh, let's uh, just jump right into the last question, which really had to do with the uh, mark of the beast. And uh, I had a question about, hey, you know, is it possible that this coronavirus pandemic thing could maybe usher in, uh, you know, the, this mark of the beast? It's found in Revelation 13 is where this mark is uh, referenced. And, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe, it, you know, I, I think, I'm not sure what the thinking is, but maybe the, the thought is it could happen, you know. There's always been talking about computer chips and maybe tracking systems, your cell phone, um, you know, maybe uh, the vaccine. I think I heard someone talk about possibly the vaccine, you know, like this mandatory vaccine that could come through for this virus and somehow mark of the beast could be slipped in through it. I'm not even sure how that would look, but, but uh, anyways. Um, so the short answer is, yeah, no. That's, that's, a, that's a basic misunderstanding about what the mark of the beast represents. Uh, it's important to recognize that um, the mark of the beast is, you, you can't first and foremost think of it in terms of some kind of physical thing. <clears throat> I think that's a real misunderstanding, all right? And of course, the whole book of Revelation, this is one of the big challenges in the book of Revelation that people oftentimes make. It's a book about signs. It's a, it's a book of symbols, if you will. And so the book of Revelation is full of all kinds of these symbols. Now, the symbols represent something literal, but the symbols themselves are not literal. And that's usually the mistake that people make is they try to make the symbol literal rather than recognize that the symbol is pointing to something literal. So, for example, like the easy one that most people can pick up pretty quickly is this beast with, you know, ten heads and, or seven heads and ten horns and, 
you know, nobody, nobody thinks <clears throat> that there's going to be a literal beast roaming on the earth with seven heads and ten horns and, you know, doing all that. <clears throat> Everybody recognized it's symbolic of something. And in the day that John wrote it, it was symbolic of most likely the Roman Empire. But the Roman Empire is just symbolic of all human empire. And uh, anyways, so, but, but, but the mark of the beast also, don't take that in terms of, that, don't think of it as a literal mark as in there's going to be a computer chip or, or, or whatever, something stamped on your forehead or, or whatever. That's not the point. Um, the real point of it is that, um, you know, those who, who worship the beast um, or worship what he represents, uh, they're basically marked out. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't, don't I'm not sure why, but um, there's so much focus on the mark of the beast, but there's actually two marks in the book of Revelation. And one, the other one is way more important. And it's called the mark of the Lord or the seal of the Lord. And it's found, I think it's Revelation 7. Um, and basically the Lord says he's going to seal his bondservants. He's going to, um, you know, mark them in a sense. And of course, we're, we know from Paul's writings, the seal of the Lord, he seals his people uh, with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, is our seal. And so, you know, when you look at that, that word, you know, mark uh, in Revelation 13, um, the Greek word uh, means to engrave. It means to sculpt. And uh, it was actually used to refer to the creation of idols because idols were oftentimes, you know, wood or stone representations and so they would carve or sculpt this idol and um, and of course you know it's we actually get our English word character from that Greek word because character is sort of an engraving if you will it's like a, a sculpture of, of who you are as a person so your your body is represents your physical person but in terms of who you are as a person in terms of like your heart your character is the sculpture of your heart, if you will, your inner person. And so I, I, I think the real picture going on there is, listen, you know, those who worship the beast are going to be sculpted by him. They're going to be engraved. They're going to, their character is going to be formed. And, and of course, you know, I think the biblical um, testimony is quite clear, and I think history just proves this as well, that we tend to become like that which we worship. Because that which we worship, you know, worship is a form of adoration. It's what we, it's what we consider to be, you know, beautiful and, uh, and worthy of adoration and, and allegiance. And, you know, and so if something is worthy of our worship, it's worthy of being imitated. And so we tend to become like that which we worship. And so those who worship the beast or what the beast represents... Uh, which is basically idolatry. It's basically all kinds of different things that have nothing to do with worship of the Lord. But we will tend to, we'll, where our character gets formed, you'll be marked, if you will, for your worship because it'll show up in who you are. And uh, it'll show up in the fact that you, you know, reject God, you know, um, that you reject Jesus, you, you reject the message of good news. And, uh, of course, those who are sealed by God you know, they, their, their character, their, who they are as a person is being, is being formed, etched, engraved, sculpted by Holy Spirit, right? Paul says that this is the Holy Spirit in us uh, who is at work. God is at work by His Holy Spirit in us. And we're being what? We're being formed, transformed into the image of God. And so you, you're, you know, someone, something is going to form who you are and is it going to be the Lord or is it going to be other forces that are not him and uh, and so you know I mean just just think it through to think that somehow you could avoid some kind of physical mark but still act in some ways like the beast or like the devil that somehow that you'd be okay because you didn't take the mark that doesn't even make any sense you know completely contradicts everything that Jesus taught, which was it's about the heart, not about the external stuff. You know, listen, you can, you know, there might be, there might be some really good reasons not to let somebody implant a computer chip in your forehead. Uh, you know, and there might even be some good reasons, you know, why you don't want to take a vaccine. Uh, but trying to avoid the mark of the beast is not a good one. Like, that's not the reason why. And don't think you could just avoid 
some kind of physical thing and then that you're going to somehow be okay. Listen, if you really want to just avoid the mark of the beast, then get the mark of the Lord because you can't have both. You can't be sealed by God and get the mark of the beast. Get the Holy Spirit. Receive Holy Spirit. Put your faith in Jesus. Receive the gifts of Holy Spirit. You don't have to worry about the mark of the beast. All right. Well, uh, that's it for today. Again, I hope you will uh, just submit some questions. Go to rolcf.net forward slash podcast. You can submit uh, questions or uh, suggestions for some topics. And uh, maybe in our next episode, we'll just talk a little bit more about this pandemic and COVID and stuff before we move on. And uh, that's it. Love you guys. Bye.